Great. Well, good good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to today's um, NC Three Rs and and GSK Three Rs Prize event. It's great to have you along uh, for what's a really always a really happy event, really important event in our calendar, um, and we get the opportunity to to celebrate the wealth of Three Rs research taking place worldwide, and and in particular look at the excellent science that has been. Um, delivered. So this afternoon we're going to hear from the sponsors of the prize in a few minutes, uh, GSK, and then we're going to have presentations from our prize winner, uh, Dr. Daniel Ferrara, um, and also our highly commended entry, um, Mr. Ben Newland. Um, after each presentation we're going to have time for some, some questions, so please feel free at any stage to pop your questions into the Q&A function in Zoom. And, um, and Alice um, is going to ask them on your, on your behalf. So we won't ask you to come on live, but we will pose your question um, to, to the speakers. Um, a little bit about, about the prize. Uh, it recognizes outstanding and original scientific research um, that either has already had or could in the future have major impacts on replacement reduction and refinement of the use of animals in research. Um, the prize is for a primary research article in a peer-reviewed journal. It has to be within the last three years, and it's open to any researcher world, worldwide in either academia or in, in industry. And we award the prize to the principal investigator uh, or to a research team or, or to any of the nominated authors. Um, it's the 17th year that we've run this, so it started in in 2005 and um, GSK have been superb supporters of this, in fact, sponsoring it right from the beginning and right from right the way through to today. Um, very grateful, um, first of all, to the NC3Rs team who, who get a lot of entries and deal with it very professionally. Uh, but also we've got a, a panel that meets that's got representatives from UK, Europe and, and the USA. And I'm really grateful to the panel. These are really difficult decisions for a very good reason, which is that we get so many excellent pieces of work that are having great impact. So um, it's always difficult choosing because everything's such high, such high quality, but they do a great job. We look at the papers in terms of the, the actual three R's impact or the potential um, that's suggested for, for the research. Uh, we look at the, the paper, we read the papers very carefully and consider the quality and the importance of the research question and as you'd expect for the NC3Rs, we look at the uh, transparency and the robustness of the study design. Uh, we look at what commitment there's been um, to disseminating the results, particularly thinking about that 3Rs impact. And, um, and we look at the strengths in place. We give a, a grant coming out to the prize winner and we look at what they're intending um, to do with that. And as I say, every year, really good quality, great to see so much good stuff being submitted. Um, and a really hard decision. So congratulations to, to the people that won. And if you, if you did put a paper in, um, you know, you can be rest assured that it was, um, it was a really high quality field. So I'm gonna pass over now, we're gonna hear from our sponsors. So um, Dr. Rahana Sadat, who's the Vice President for Quality and Risk Management at GSK is going to say a few words. Thank you for the introduction. I'm delighted to be representing GSK in the 17th year of our partnership with the National Centre for the Three R's for this prize celebrating excellence in global science, contributing to replacement, reduction and refinement. In GSK, we are uniting science, technology and talent to get ahead of disease together. Our ambition over the next 10 years is to positively impact the health of more than 2.5 billion people. Our GSK strategy is centered around preventing and treating disease, focusing on the science and operating responsibly. Technological advances mean that much of our research can be done using non-animal methods, which we are really proud of. However, these methods do not always provide the exact insight our scientists need to determine how a potential vaccine or medicine affects disease me mechanisms or biological systems. Therefore, studies in animals are still needed. When alternative approaches are not possible, we are committed to being responsible. 
The three R's principles of replacement, reduction and refinement, and the Penn R science. From applying peer review, ensuring robust study design, maximizing data generated, expanding on the use of complex in vitro models and applying in silico approaches as alternatives. I'm not envious of the judging panel with such a phenomenal number of high quality applicants. Selecting the prize winners is not easy. Before we congratulate the winners, let me personally thank all of the applicants for their entries. Your entries exemplify the passion and dedication held towards the 3R strategy. So let us hear about the international 3R's prize winners. We have a highly commended award and a prize winner. The highly commended award goes to Dr. Ben Newland. Congratulations, Ben. The prize winner goes to Dr. Daniel Ferreira. Many, many congratulations. Thank you. Great, thank you so much again to, to GSK for their, their long-term um, support, which has really established um, the prize in our, in our annual schedule. So we're going to move on now to hear um, from um, the, the two that were um, highly commended or, or winning. And we're going to start with the winner. Uh, just to remind you, uh, please do put questions in. There's a, I've just checked, there's a tab at the bottom of your Zoom page called Q&A. Pop your question in there and um, Alice will pose it after we've heard each one of the presentations. Um, so we're going to, um, to start with the winner, which is uh, Daniel Ferrara. Um, and Daniel is from the I3S Institute of Research and Innovation in Health in Portugal. Um, the paper was entitled Alternative to Soft Lithography for the Fabrication of Organ on a Chip, Elastomeric Based Devices and Micro Actuators. And it was published in Advanced Science in 2021. I'll leave it to Daniel to take us through the detail, but just to say that the panel recognize the potential for this method to increase the accessibility of organ on a chip designs to laboratories worldwide. And um, given the, the vast number of applications that we see for the future for organ on the chip systems, um, it was felt that this had huge potential for the future of the, of the three R's. So let me congratulate Daniel and ask him to give his presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. Uh, I hope you can all see my uh, my screen now. Okay, again, thank you very much for the kind of uh, introduction. Uh, I need to thank also uh, the NC3R Center uh, for the invitation to be here and uh, also uh, for recognizing the uh, work that we have done and also, of course, the sponsor JS GSK for uh, believing in our work. And today, uh, as, as mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about an alternative to soft lithography to fabricate organ on a chip. But I thought about starting a bit more on the brighter side. And um, let me tell you where I come from. I hail from the city of Porto. It's a very beautiful and sunny uh, city. If you have never been here, I strongly recommend that you uh, pay a visit. It, it will be well worth your time. And um, if you see here on the lower left, this is the, on the lower right, I'm sorry, this is the I3S, the institute where I'm currently based at. Uh, we have uh, currently three uh, integrative programs, the cancer, where I am uh, a part of, the host interaction and response, and the neurobiology and neurologic disorders. It's a very beautiful city, also in the city of Porto. Now to give you a bit of context, and about uh, my, my career path. Um, I started in neurobiology, but soon after, around 2006, I moved to the um, uh, cancer research area in DNA repair. And shortly after, um, around 2007 or uh, middle 2007, I started working in gastric cancer. In particular, I was studying the molecular mechanisms, mechanisms that are involved in the malignant transformation from the normal epithelium in cancer towards a malignant phenotype and the process that is involved between the epithelial things and chemical transition that may lead to metastasis and then the reverse process that is 
uh, mesenchymal to epithelial transition and the establishment of um, um, uh, metastatic yeast somewhere uh, around the body. And um, throughout this, throughout my work, uh, I, I soon realized that uh, animal models had some uh, limitations uh, in terms of studying uh, uh, human disease. And, and simply put, it, it's very difficult that uh, an animal model replicates uh, precisely the human physiology. So when I was contributing my PhD project, I was brainstorming a bit on uh, what would be my path. And I, I came to the realization that I wanted to work on a fully human derived model to study the physiology of the stomach. And that's where organ on a chip technology comes into play. So uh, organ on a chip, uh, the, the, the term chip uh, is borrowed from the technology that is used uh, uh, to make computer chips and microtransistors. Um, and because initially the same technology was used, the term uh, was, was uh, borrowed for this technology. And this technology is based on microfluidics and it's a, a, a clever merge between microengineering and cell biology. So an organ on a chip is a microfluidics chip that is designed for cell culture, but it also, it's not just an overly complex uh, model, a 3D cell culture model. It also wants to replicate a functional subunit of an organ, being the beating of a heart, the, um, the filtration unit of a kidney, or the epithelium of the stomach. The key point here is that we are reproducing um, a functional subunit of the organ we are emulating. And uh, the, the, the organ on a chip, they are trying to position themselves here uh, at um, an interface between the basic research and the clinical research, perhaps as uh, surrogate models to uh, substitute the animal models in a preclinical context. But I think the most interesting point about this, this technology is, is their, their ability to operate in a personalized uh, clinical uh, research in which we can extract cells derived from a patient. We can grow them inside one of these chips and that's, for example, response to a drug or uh, whatever we are uh, trying to uh, understand from these patients. And then the response that we get on the organ on a chip can be fed back to the uh, patient itself. And thus we create a personalized treatment from, for, uh, for, these, for these people. Of course, Fabricating these, these, um, these devices is not always trivial. The most common, uh, commonly used technique is called soft lithography. And the term soft comes from the fact that uh, these techniques use a soft elastomer, which is a uh, biocompatible uh, silicone called polydimethyl siloxane, or PDMS for short. And if you can see here from the uh, workflow for a biochip fabrication, after CAD design, it takes quite a few days to produce a, a chip. And, that, and this is just an estimation for a, a simple one or two layer chip. If we want to produce a, a more complex, a multi-layered uh, chip with seven, eight uh, or nine uh, layers, the, the time of fabrication actually will increase. And that's where our work comes in. Uh, we propose the fast alternative to soft lithography for the fabrication of these organ on a chip devices. And uh, uh, for this, uh, we used an adaptation of a technique called surography, which uses a cutting plotter and uh, off-the-shelf uh, PDMS sheets. Uh, PDMS is, as I mentioned, the uh, biocompatible silicone that uh, I mentioned before, but uh, we can obtain these sheets that pre cured off the shelf. And so we simplified the entire fabrication process into three simple steps. That is CAD design. We design all the structures needed. We feed them to the machine and the machine cuts in a few seconds all the structures needed to produce a fully functional stomach on a chip or uh, other organ on a chip. In fact, we can actually um, uh, obtain in a single run more than one chip. And then the, the, the process of assembly is also uh, straightforward. We just cut the structures from this PDMS laminate and we assemble uh, using you know, some conventional uh, um, techniques used also uh, in soft lithography. But of course, with, with, with any new technique, there are some important uh, measurements that need to be benchmarked. 
uh, uh, and we had we had to look at uh, at these points. In particular, if the procedure has an adequate resolution to replicate the dimensions that we uh, drawn on CAD, if the uh, devices uh, made with this technique can operate long term without falling apart, if the fabrication methodology is biocompatible, and most important. Because we are looking at uh, organ on a chip technology, sometimes we want to replicate not only the architecture, but also the dynamic nature of the organ beat, the beating of the art, or the uh, the peristalsis like motion of a, um, of a, of the stomach, and thus we need to integrate microactuators that reproduce physiological levels of stretching, and so we started by looking at resolution of our, of our process. And we compared deviation to computer-aided design. And we looked at um, in terms of structure, width, and thickness, and also looked at the influence of geometry. What we did was get PDMS sheets of different thicknesses. And then we cut a rectangular shape of uh, decreasing size uh, with this, uh, with, uh, in the cutting plotter. And what we saw is that we can have very adequate uh, cutting resolution uh, uh, to structures that are uh, down to 400 micron wide. Of course, if we stick to the uh, uh, um, thinner substrates, we can even go down to 200 uh, microns uh, in terms of cutting resolution. Of course, this is nowhere near what can be achieved, for example, with conventional soft lithography, where the resolution is at the nano level, but still many of the of the uh, organ on a chip models that are reported in the literature they are in the millimetric range so this is quite acceptable and then we looked at the influence of geometry whether cutting linear features angular features or circular features as outlined here in the in this graph had an influence on the cutting resolution what we saw is that the machine has a bit more uh, of a difficult time in cutting angular features such as this one. Still, all of the, of the uh, geometries were uh, cut with a variation of less than 10%. So this is quite acceptable for our application. And we, uh, by testing that the resolution uh, was uh, good enough, we then uh, proceeded to test whether we could uh, produce uh, a model uh, such as this one that I depicted here, uh, and if the model could resist uh, the manipulation uh, throughout the cell culture process. If you see here, this is a typical uh, organ on a chip layout where you have slabs, for example, of PDMS bonded against PDMS, but also sometimes you have intercalating perforated membranes, such as in this case, and we need to ensure that everything remains sealed. And while binding a PDMS slab against the PDMS slab, so it's the same material, it's pretty straightforward. And by applying oxygen plasma, we can have an effective bond. It is not that trivial to bind a PET membrane to a PDMS slab. And so we had to do a chemical treatment to bind effectively the PET membrane to the PDMS. And here we tested several uh, silane formulations. And what we did was fabricate a very simple uh, X-crossed or X-shaped um, microfluidic device. And then we sandwiched here um, a PET membrane in between. And this is what you see here. This V here, the darker zone, is the crossing of the two channels. And this is the area where PET is in contact with the PDMS. And what we did, we uh, closed all the fluidic outlets except for one, and here we injected liquids to increasing amounts of pressure within our, our chip, and we assessed if there was delamination, that is, if liquid was seeping in this contact between the PET membrane and the PDMS. And there was actually one clear top performer, which was the bisamino silane. Not only did it perform well at in this uh, setup of room temperature, but it also performed well under cell culture conditions, that is under a humidified atmosphere and at 37 degrees. You can see here the, the arrows are pointing towards the side of the cell culture substrate. You can see here at the time of seeding that the cells remain all within their confines. And even after 72 hours in culture, cells still remain within their designated um, uh, so, uh, 
area. So the process was uh, effective in uh, binding uh, long-term our chip. Of course, because we are doing a chemical treatment of the membrane, we need to make sure that the cells that are growing over the selenized surface are behaving uh, in the same way as cells that are grown under standard conditions on plastic. And here we compare the phenotype of cells uh, growing under plastic with those uh, uh, over a selenized surface. We did not see any difference in the phenotype. All, both populations remain fully proliferative, as seen here by the ki 67 staining, and the population doubling time was also the same. And finally, we also followed the population uh, a long time and we measured the metabolic activity and both populations displayed the same uh, metabolism. So silanization does not affect cellular physiology and thus this validates the, the procedure for cell culture applications. And um, concerning the microactuator design, now we want to reproduce with our work, and, and this will be the, the future work I will be presenting also uh, uh, part of it. We want to reproduce um, a stomach on a chip, and thus we want to replicate the processes like motion. So we not only uh, produced a microfluidic portion, we also built a microactuator, which consists of a hollow chamber, as seen here, which is stopped by a thin, flexible PDMS membrane. And by applying vacuum in this actuation chamber, we distend the PDMS membrane, which in turn distends the cell culture substrate above, and thus we are physically stretching our cells. And um, we assess the amount of sur surface expansion that we could elicit with our uh, device, and we saw that we could uh, go from uh, around 2.5 all the way to 22%. And this was quite fine and is within the range that we wanted. For example, for the gut cells in vivo, it is reported that they suffer a surface, a surface expansion of around 10%. So we were uh, really happy with it. And then we went to the, uh, the, the main part of the work, and this is what, where it gets exciting. So we worked on developing uh, with this technique, a stomach on a chip. And here we used um, a moderately differentiated uh, cell line, which you can see are grown uh, in static conditions over a membrane on a transwell cup. You see that the cells under static conditions uh, remain uh, largely flattened, resembling a squamous epithelium. And uh, excitingly, once we start applying flow, we see already some changes on our uh, epithelium, and this is uh, exacerbated when flow is coupled with actuation. We see a fully polarized state with cells having an apical and a basal site, elongated nuclei uh, placed at the basal portion of the cell, and ecadrin expression exclusively at the basal lateral side. Um, also, the cell height of these uh, of our artificial epithelium increased significantly, and this is very similar to what is found uh, on the stomach epithelium. And interestingly, we also looked at the expression of mucin one, one of the mucins from the gastric mucus. We can see that although this cell line expresses basally mucin one, it's uh, it's expressed exclusively uh, at the cytoplasm of some of the cells only. But when we apply flow and actuation, we actually see the formation of these kind of globular structures with uh, mucin one expression exclusively at the apical portion. And this is what is seen in the normal gastric mucosa and also in other uh, advanced models uh, of the uh, gastric system. So all in all, we uh, assessed many aspects of the, of the technique uh, with success. And we were successful in developing a fabrication method that can generate organ on a cheap prototypes for a fraction of the cost and time compared to software photography. And importantly, the modularity of this system means that we can make adaptations on the run while uh, uh, building our chip. And this is important, especially in uh, complex systems such as this, where we may need to change one or two modules of the, of the chip and test them, for example, independently. Uh, concerning the three R's impacts uh, of this work, we actually looked at the metrics of our own group for 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. And uh, we reported the use of 554 new mice for drug testing, uh, in particular in gas cancer, gastric cancer therapies. 
with each experiment using approximately 100 mice that are divided in 10 arms of 10 animals each. And we estimate that by performing, for example, the pre-screening of drugs using this organ on a cheap technology, we can potentially reduce up to three experimental arms uh, before proceeding to testing in animal models. And that is effectively a reduction of 30% on the number of animals used. And uh, if we extrapolate, for example, for the metrics of our own institute's cancer integrative program that reported 2,300 animals, um, we could see a reduction from this number down to 1,610, which is actually a significant number. And uh, although I'm giving you the, uh, the numbers uh, for the cancer integrative program, uh, because the what we are uh, showing here is actually a fabrication methodology. This can be applied not only for cancer research, but for many other areas. So in, in practical terms, the impact of, uh, of this work could even be far more reaching than just what I'm showing here. And also because of this, the low cost of the technique, the ease of access, because we are only using off-the-shelf equipment, the fast turnaround time, the full modularity, and the small bench top footprints, we can actually have a, a, a technique that could truly democratize access to organ on a chip worldwide. And this could be uh, uh, indeed really valuable. In terms of my work um, and, uh, and the, being awarded this prize, for which I am very thankful, uh, I'm hoping to kickstart my independent research career uh, with this prize, namely by setting up a microfabrication and microfluidics unit at the OC institution using the techniques uh, or the technology that I've described, and also continue my work in the disposing of the genesis of hereditary stomach cancer through organ on a chip technology. And for that, we are already advancing uh, our models. Uh, we are now uh, working with a, a more complex model that replicates not only the epithelium, but the three inner layers of the stomach namely the epithelium, the lamina propria, and basement membrane. And we want uh, to uh, study with this model um, uh, the, the potential identification of biomarkers that may signal, uh, signal disease initiation in hereditary diffuse gastric cancer patients, and thus helping in the stratification of individuals that are at high risk of developing disease from those that are at low risk of developing a disease. And finally, and perhaps the most important uh, slides of my presentation, uh, this work uh, came to life uh, through an outstanding collaboration between many people and many groups. I have uh, uh, many uh, uh, a person to thank for, uh, the Biofabrication Group and Pedro Granja, the Expression Regulation in Cancer Group and Carol Oliveira, also the Jean Pond from Thin Film Mems and Biomems Group, uh, Peter Hurtle from the Cell Chip Group and all the people that are that were involved in this uh, work and that were part of these groups. Also, my thanks go to Cristina Barrias, Maria Lazaro, of course, the Biotech Health PhD program for making this uh, work a reality, and also all the all the funding agencies. And last but not least, of course, the NC3R um, Center for uh, awarding this prize and a special thank you word also for the sponsor GSQ. And I will be happy to take your uh, questions and thank you very much also for your attention. Brilliant, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, it's really lovely to be able to hear about your work. Um, as Daniel you. mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, do please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so do have some questions that's come through. Um, one question is surrounding the cost of the chips and the cost of the equipment. Obviously, this is much lower cost than the traditional methods, but I just wondered if you were able to provide some um, some comparisons for us. Sure. Uh, the, the, uh, I think the, the, um, in terms of, of price, it's really clear cut that it's really, really uh, different. And for example, if you consider uh, work that, uh, that is being done on uh, a clean room facility, uh, the maintenance, the annual maintenance of a clean room facility may be upwards of a million uh, every year. So 
Uh, we are talking here about uh, a cutting quarter that could be around uh, 2,000 euro. And then the, the PDMS uh, uh, laminates that we are using, they are bought in uh, a meters roll because they are used for industrial applications and they are usually also uh, uh, cheap. Uh, I, I, I would not say that they will be cheaper than the, the, the uncured pre-polymer that we can um, that we can purchase uh, for um, the conventional soft lithography, maybe end to end in terms of, of raw products, but in terms of equipment and the time that we save, I think that's the, the, the true uh, saving. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, the, the limitation is resolution. And uh, there are some things that we really cannot do uh, with this kind of, uh, of technology that we really need to go to soft lithography. Brilliant, thank you. Um, would you be able to um, expand on what the actuation means uh, in relation to kind of your, your chips and the microactuators? Okay, so the, yeah, I call, I call them uh, microactuators. It's, it's the, the term that we use and we can uh, usually see uh, in, the, in the literature. It's, um, it's a way to describe the, the portion of the chip that actually elicits the stretching of the cell culture substrate. Okay, some chips are designed so that the cell, the cell substrate or the membrane where the cells are seated are stretched uh, directly. In our case, we designed the microactuator, which is just a hollow chamber that is placed below the, the cell culture chamber and we apply a vacuum to it. So, uh, the, the microactuator is stopped by a flexible membrane. We apply, apply a vacuum. The, the, um, the vacuum pulls the PDMS membrane, which in turn pulls down the cell culture substrate. So the microactuation, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the term that I'm using to refer to the actual uh, process that physically stretches the cell culture substrate and expands the, the cells. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and going back to um, your use of the bis bisonemo silane to, mm -hmm. to bond, can that be used to bond silanized glass, apologies for my pronunciation, um, mm -hmm. and plasma activated the PDF, PDMS microchannel without any delamination? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, you, 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 can, you can use uh, silanization also to bind glass to PDMS, but uh, from my own experience, I think that's a, a, a process that I would not uh, that I would not go to because we were able to very efficiently bind uh, glass uh, to PPMS with just oxygen plasma. Actually, I have I have not uh, mentioned on the presentation for uh, time's sake. The the bottom of our chip is actually a glass microscope slide for ease of handling and, and because we can just get our chip and have it on the on the cell on the on the microscope stage so it's much easier to to also do the, the live imaging and we were uh, able to bind very efficiently glass to uh, PDMS just with oxygen plasma without having to go through the uh, extra step of silanization the pet membranes those they do need to um, to this extra step, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and someone here has congratulated you on your very well-deserved prize. Um, they ask, what do you think will be the main challenges in getting sort of your, your method more widely uptaken um, of this new design? Okay, the, 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 met the method or, or uh, I did not understand if it's my design. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the method in general. Daniel, the, method. the method. So in general. the design is is fairly complex, but but because it answer it answers or it it replies to a question that we were wanting to to uh, to address. Of course, the methodology. Uh, I think the the these cutting plotters they are available uh, worldwide. So I really don't foresee any uh, difficulty in having a, a laboratory equipped with this kind of, uh, of technology. Even the, the, uh, the PDMS laminates, they are industrial grade uh, laminates, so they are uh, usually available uh, uh, worldwide. So uh, it's just having the idea and going forward for it. And the, the, the price of entry is very low, so uh, 
should be uh, uh, pretty straightforward. No, that's great. Um, a great, great way of trying out sort of organ on a chip and making these prototypes. Yeah. Um, how do you keep the chips sterile um, to the cell culture? Okay, yeah. So during the fabrication, uh, um, we always try to work. We are not uh, working in sterile conditions. Sterile is, is done upwards. Uh, what, first, what we do to emulate a bit what is seen in a clean room facility, we try to, to work uh, in as clean as possible environment. So we have a, a, a dedicated flow, uh, flow booth that also has extraction. So we minimize, for example, dust uh, during operation, but we, we do not do the fabrication uh, in a sterile environment. What we do is the sterilization post assembly. So we expose the entire chip to UV radiation, and then we, uh, we uh, perfuse uh, for three rounds with uh, ethanol at 70%. And then we uh, flush out very well all the ethanol with PBS, and the ship is, is ready to be used under, cell under aesthetic cell culture conditions. We actually managed to run uh, chips uh, up to 15 days. We could even culture them more, but for what we were aiming at, we did not proceed, and there was no, uh, no contamination. So this, this kind of procedure is very efficient in having uh, uh, the chips sterile, but it has to be done uh, post fabrication. And so presumably these chips would be sort of a, a one-time use. It wouldn't be something you could repeatedly use. Yes, I, I would. I would not recommend using uh, 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 more than once. Not only for sterility reasons, but also for uh, uh, cross contamination. Uh, and 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 even what, even if you detach the the cells, what we do usually is uh, live cell imaging or, for example. Uh, uh, imaging on the microscope without breaking apart the uh, the chip. So we get the chip, we monostain, we go to the microscope. So we never actually flush out the cells. We use them as it is, and that's why we mounted them on, on glass slides. But I would really not recommend reusing it. And perhaps this is also one of the good advantages of the speed with which we can actually fabricate these chips is that uh, it's, I don't really see a need to reuse them because uh, you can produce them really, really fast. Amazing. Um, and can you use your technology to make um, other organs onto your chip, uh, organ on chip designs? Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the technology, it's, it's just a template. We, we are doing a stomach on a chip because it serves our scientific uh, uh, area and uh, the, the the question that we are the questions that we are trying to answer but the the technology can be applied to any organ on a chip actually it just have to be the the idea uh, is the limit so if you have an application and you can you you can visualize it and design it in, in 3D, you can you can run with this technology any kind of uh, organ on a chip. That's brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think that's all the time we've got for questions for this one. So I Thank will you very much. Uh, hand back over to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Daniel, for a fantastic presentation and um, Alice for handling the, the question and answers really well. So thank you to all of you. We're going to move on now to our second presentation, and this is for our highly commended um, award and delighted to introduce uh, Ben Newland from Cardiff University. Uh, Ben's team uh, submitted a paper on cryogel scaffolds for regionally constrained delivery of lysophosphatidyl choline to the central nervous system. Um, slice cultures and this is a model for focal demyelination for multiple sclerosis research it was published in 2019 in acta biomateria um, and again i'll let i'll let ben tell us all about the the system and his paper but the the panel um noted that this was a um a technology that had potential for replacement uh in an area where there was high severity in the current animal model and looking at an area where there's a high degree of complexity in the in the models. Um, we were impressed by the research team's proactive work in disseminating the technology and demonstrating the potential for the, the three R's impact in the future. So Ben, over to you. 
Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Yep, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about the uh, the mouthful there for for Kevin in in in, in the in the uh, paper title there. But uh, yeah, really, this is uh, as Kevin's alluded to, making a model of multiple sclerosis, and I'll talk to you a little bit about MS and what we mean by modelling. And yes, the the, the the big idea of this is that we can replace live animals and reduce the um, total animal use as well. So I'll come on to all those parts. So just starting off, if my my computer will work. Let's see if I can. There we go. Just about MS very briefly to give you a bit of background. Um, the It's classified in part by uh, a, a loss of myelin, the myelin sheath that wraps around your nerve fibers or around your axons. And this results in a disruption of, of the signal. And it can also lead to cell death, as we've uh, been alluding to recently. So um, the one thing to take away from this is that in, in um, patients who have MS, the pathology or the, the problem or the damage isn't spread evenly over our brains and our spinal cord. It happens in these, in these sort of patches and our body is constantly, or the, the patient's body is constantly trying to remyelinate or repair the damage that's happened to those neurons, okay? Now, if we want to find out ways to help our own bodies, you know, uh, repair that myelin, then we've got to be able to get a patchy nature in whichever model it is that we, we want to use. Now, what do I mean by a model? A model is a test system, okay, where we can test out the drugs that we want to, that we're developing, for example, and see if they work. So very briefly going over, over a, a slide here that sort of just sprinkles out some ideas of, of what we can do to have a look at um, uh, MS in a dish. For example, you could have in vitro culture where it sells in a dish. And I've tried to highlight in red some problems of that. It lacks complexity of the brain environment and there's no means of getting that, that patchy effect. Now, really interesting to hear from our previous prize winner, Daniel, you know, that's the whole point of these organomic chip is to try and improve the complexity of those, those systems and therefore how applicable they are to a human condition. However, there are other alternatives as well. Ex vivo um, culture, which is where you take brain you from a rodent, for example, cut it into slices, and then it can be grown uh, in a dish. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But again, there's no means of creating that patchy nature that we have in MS, which is really important if we're going to work out how is the healthy area affecting the damaged area or vice versa. Now, of course, there are animal uh, models, and these are actually very good. Uh, they, they can have this patchy nature of um, demyelination. Um, and yeah, you, the, you can see the spontaneous uh, repair and things like that. But of course, as I'll allude to in a bit, this uses up a large number of animals. And as Kevin mentioned in the introduction, the Home Office classifies these you know, injecting a, a, a toxin basically directly into the brain as a severe uh, animal procedure. So um, I, I'll talk to you a little bit about how we've worked on this ex vivo culture and, and where we've improved this. So before I do that, I was, uh, while I was doing my postdoc out in Germany, I was invited very kindly up to give a talk in Edinburgh University. And, and it was interesting because I've been invited by someone completely different, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, Professor Anna Williams, who's in, in, the, in the photo there, uh, came up to me afterwards and said, oh, do you want to come up to my lab? And, and I've, I've got a few things to ask you. So off we went. And, um, and she showed me this model that she has, or sorry, talked me through, should I say, this model that she has, where they take a brain from a rodent and spinal cord and they can section it up into slices, culture it on, on with, with cell culture medium underneath, which basically feeds it. And what they could do is they could add uh, basically a detergent, LPC is the short name that Kevin had to get his mouth around the, the long name in the, uh, in the paper title. But what this does is, is uh, I've shown it just sh changing the, the slices completely red there. What it does is it, um, uh, it removes that myelin from around the, uh, around the neurons uh, and it causes that damage globally across the whole um, across the whole brain slice. So we can't see how the, the, the healthy part is interacting with the damaged part. So um, uh, 
the I, I took with me um, some of my biomaterials, and I'll explain about them more uh, uh, in a second, with me in, a, in an Eppendorf tube. I'm a bit weird, so I, I bring things along like this. And it was actually really good because she could have a look at them and say, hey, could you design it to do this? And, and just because we're online doesn't mean to say, I know I'm only a small box on your screen, but here's a little squidgy one. I won't squidge it too hard. Otherwise, the uh, the food coloring will come out on my computer uh, keyboard. But uh, so uh, great advantage of bringing things along. She could have a look at it. And she said, well, with, with one of these things like here, here again is a, is a video of it just showing how robust these are. They're very soft and they have an, a, an open pore like structure. So from then on, Anna Williams just called them sponges. OK, so a very technical term. She said, could you design your sponges into these sort of cylinder shapes? OK, and at the right depth, etc., so that we could place those, as I've, sh I've shown here at the bottom, could we fill those up with that demyelinating agent and place it next to the slices? In that way, we will then, as this little spread of red is showing, you'll get a focal area or a small area, a patch of it that is damaged. And then you can see the interaction between the healthy area and the damaged area. And so looking at this uh, under a microscope, just very briefly, if you can see my, my mouse pointer there on, the, on this, this area here, you do get a really clear line between the damaged area being mainly shown in red there and the healthy neurons that have got their myelin in green there. OK, so we get this damage and it repairs itself after a couple of weeks. So you can really see get the damage, you can see the repair, and then you can watch all the things like the host immune response and things like that and what's going on around there. So um with that i'd just like to say a, a little bit about why we think this is important in terms of nc3rs okay well if you can imagine uh, uh what this does is we can take from from one animal we can get about six brain slices and from a spinal cord of the animal between five and ten slices okay so that suddenly means that if you wanted to do a simple experiment let's let's outline a really simple scenario you want to test one therapeutic okay you need to have a control to see if it works and maybe you look just at two time points okay a time point one a time point two and you have eight animals per group okay you can quickly see how that racks up animals okay and if you had all the same groups uh then using these uh, brain and spinal cord slices you know you could reduce that to to two animals okay obviously there's breeding involved in other things but generally two animals would be used to give you the same information as 32 um, live animals being used okay also bear in mind that um, this replaces the live animal model okay and the uh, as Kevin said we've been quite proactive in trying to get this out to other groups so We've teamed up with uh, Professor Yvonne Dombrowski recently, and she works in uh, Queen's University Belfast. And basically forward projecting the, the, the studies that she wanted to do and had planned to do, um, she had accounted for 430 animals in, in, the, uh, in the grant proposal. And our idea is that we could actually, for, for her question, we could completely stop doing the, the live animal experiment and we could replace that to doing the slice cultures. So she's setting those up now and that would in effect reduce the number of animals used down to, to 64. And not only that, but it means that we can look at it at multiple different time points. We get a really good idea of what's going on um, and it's very quick and easy to set up. So um, with that, we've now, we're, we're trying to um, we're, we're trying to develop um, protocols and videos and training videos to allow other groups uh, around the world to take this up. And these so far are, are the, uh, the names of um, uh, researchers across the world that are very interested in, in using this in their lab. And they've projected how many mice that they would uh, be saving by, um, or reducing the use of, should I say, by taking up this model. So, um, with the prize money, I'm very uh, grateful for, for, for having this. So uh, a professor from uh, Korea, um, Byung Kim, has been in touch and he said, well, could we do something similar where we take your brain slice cultures and we add uh, some, some reagents to them that will cause a deprivation of oxygen and glucose? And stroke, as I've kind of put one of those magic images up on, on the left-hand side, is a focal problem, okay? And so we have an area of damage 
and we have a sort of region around the edge which isn't quite so damaged and then healthy brain tissue. They would really like in, uh, to, to model that in their lab as at the moment they use severe animal models. So that is where I'm concentrating uh, my, my time now and using the prize money to fund that. So with that, just want to acknowledge people from my uh, old group where I worked in Dresden. I'm now in Cardiff University uh, and people in Edinburgh and Belfast. And uh, thank the NC3Rs now for uh, helping me to, to try and spread or helping us, should I say, spread that uh, out to other labs. And happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, thank you for giving that presentation all about your prize winning research. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the cryogels. Um, are they particularly difficult to make? Are there any specialist equipment that you might need? Um, for these ones, you need a freezer. OK, we used to use a normal freezer. I've got now a specialist one where I can change the temperature of it. It's not particularly expensive. Um, and I've got a handheld UV lamp, which costs about 600 uh, pounds or something like that because that's uh, what's used to and, and then the actual ingredients of them themselves is cheaper chips so um i am i'm now trying to to work out a way where we can not only i can provide these to other labs i'm already doing that but also make it very easy for other labs to to do okay so yeah and the standard minus 20 freeze i used to have one in germany where the, the top bit was just for me and i'd open it up i put my, my reagents in shove the uv lamp in for two minutes and bring it out and it's all done so no uh it, 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 these ones are relatively straightforward to me Brilliant, thank you. Um, and other than the um, the sort of ischemic stroke, are there sort of other areas where you could see uh, a similar technique being used to study other um, sort of neurodegenerative diseases? Well, it's very interesting you should say. So there are there's a group in uh, in Freiburg in Germany who just approached me. They grow um, biopsy samples in a similar manner from patients with glioblastoma, a type of brain cancer. And they've done really fantastic work, uh, as, as um, Daniel sort of alluded to, of having this patient-focused um, study. Or have I frozen? Sorry, did I freeze up or am I still going? Hello? I can still hear you. You're OK. I think there was a bit of a glitch, but we've got yeah, you back. Right, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, uh, they, uh, they've used that already to... Uh, to inform themselves of what drugs would work for a specific patient and show the outcomes of that patient. And now they want to, to, to work out, can we deliver things regionally to these, to, to these um, glioblastoma? Because we know it's a very heterogene heterogeneous sorry, cell population. So cells in the core might be very different from cells at the periphery. And so really excited to start work with them. In fact, I just put the, the cryogels in the post to them yesterday. So. But yeah, probably lots of other uses. So if you guys think of it, I, I never really think outside of the, the world of neuroscience. So, you know, cardiac, whatever, um, gut. Um, yeah, anyone listening is free to get in contact with me. So, yeah. Oh, no, that's brilliant to hear. Also, for, um, interesting to hear cry gels can go on the train as well as in the post. They can. They're going to <laughs> Where they need to be. We make them and they, they we sterilize them. They go off dry. It's not not like a hydrogel where you have to keep it hydrated and, and you know, it rips to bits and things like that. It's very easy to use. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, you mentioned about using human tissue. Is is that a possibility to use sort of other different tissue types other than the um, the mice that you've kind of you kind of focused on for this presentation? Yeah, well, I feel um, a little bit bad now because I haven't mentioned <laughs> Katie Long, who's in uh, in King's College London, who I've done a huge amount of this work with. She's basically uh, has been working on on why our brains fold in just basically in brain development. And oh, I feel terrible now because a lot of this work has been informed um, together with her. She's uh, used our cryogels to deliver specifically to certain areas of the brain. And it, we can use that then to track where cells move and migrate throughout the tissue and why our brains form our folded structure. And she's got lots of other uh, future uses for those. So yeah, perfectly applicable to human tissue. With these images, I showed that the, if the slice was here, we'd put it next to it, but we've also made some that can be placed on top, taken off, placed on top. We've made them line shape or round or all sorts of different shapes to try and get to different brain regions. So yes is the answer. 
I and how, okay. sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I was going to say, how thick are your slices? Is it possible to get sort of um, sort of images of the slices all of the way through the, the, the thickness using the microscopy techniques? So uh, this would be a question for Anna Williams. I know they uh, typically will use about 300 micrometer um, uh, sections of brain tissue, but um, and I haven't seen any problems of them uh, imaging through that, but that is a long way for confocal microscopy. So maybe with something like multi-photon microscopy is the, is the answer there. So. Brilliant, thank you. I think that's all the questions we've got through. So I shall hand back to Kevin to wrap up this meeting. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Super, thanks ever so much. Um, so um, let me just thank um, Alice, um, Emma and others in the team for making it such an enjoyable event and the, and the work to get us to this, this point, which has been considerable. Um, so I'm going to bring the, the event to the, to the, to a close. Um, thanks again to the panel members. It was a really, um, it was enjoyable, but quite a tough process to make the, the decision. Obviously, thanks to GSK for the 17 years of support. We work with them as with other companies on a number of projects. So we really appreciate their long term commitment um, to this. The, the webinar that you've been part of today is going to be recorded. So it'll be made available um, on the website in the next, um, next few days. And we'll have a news item officially announcing um, the awards um, as well. So um, on that, thanks ever so much for attending. Uh, special thanks uh, to Daniel and Ben for really good papers and, and excellent presentations today. And we hope to see you again at future NC3Rs events. Thanks very much, everyone.